Uh, our presentation today is titled uh, Me Too and the Future of Women's Rights in China, uh, which will explore recent development in gender relations in China and the political challenges that often lead to women's inequality in that country. Um, and our speaker is coming to us today from New York. Uh, Leda Hong Fincher is a journalist who has written for a number of distinguished outlets, the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, and many others. Um, fluent in Mandarin, she is the first American to receive a PhD from Tsinghua University's Department of Sociology in Beijing and is currently a research associate at Columbia University. Uh, Leda's latest book uh, has received a, a great deal of attention. It's called Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist, uh, Feminist Awakening in China and was named by the New York Public Library as one of its essential reads on feminism. So I'm really delighted that Leda uh, has agreed to join us today uh, and anticipate that we will learn a great deal. So Leda, uh, the time is yours. Um, we will uh, move to a Q&A period at about uh, 12.35, 12.40 today uh, and, and anticipate that we'll have about 20 minutes for audience questions both in person and over Zoom. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me? I hope so. Um, thank you so much to Brigham Young University for inviting me here to speak virtually. Um, and thanks, I understand that uh, there are some students who, who are gathered in person, which is great. Um, and I hope that someday, <laughs> before too long, I'll be able to travel again and give these talks in person. Um, so I'm gonna begin the talk today by talking about uh, a case that has been in the news a lot. It's the case of a very famous tennis star named Peng Shui. And um, I'm actually going to share my screen here. Uh, Stan, are you able to see it? Okay, fabulous. So this is, uh, I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to the news, but of course the Winter Olympics are being held in Beijing right now. And um, this, the International Olympic Committee has actually spoken a lot about this tennis player who is one of China's most beloved athletes. So she's extremely famous. She's a huge celebrity in China. Um, I mean, a Wimbledon doubles champion, but she is just beloved by millions in China. Now on November 2nd, she posted a very lengthy uh, narrative on Weibo, which is China's equivalent of Twitter. And in this post, she described basically the former vice premier of China named Zhang Gali of sexually assaulting her and then uh, beginning an on again and off again, years long relationship with her. And it, it was very lengthy, but here is a translated quote from that post of hers. She said, like an egg hitting a rock or a moth to the flame, courting self-destruction, I'll tell the truth about you. So this appeared on Weibo, which is very heavily censored. Um, nonetheless, her lengthy accusation was up on Weibo for everybody on social media in China to see for about half an hour before it was deleted. And not only was her post deleted, um, but all references to her, to Peng Shui, to the Chinese official she had accused of sexually assaulting her, Zhang Gaoli, um, even words tangentially related like tennis ball um, and quotes from her, uh, her lengthy post, um, all sorts of references um, were deleted as well and, and very heavily censored. So to this day, that, that was on November 2nd, and then Peng Shui simply disappeared. We did not know where she was for a long time. And 
during that period of disappearance where we didn't know where she was, um, there was a uh, group that is a diaspora group of Chinese feminists. And they're actually on Twitter as well using uh, the Twitter handle Free Chinese Feminists. And um, they started posting these projections of uh, art on the walls of buildings and bridges. And oops, I just want to go back to that one. Sorry about that. Uh, saying things like Chinese women said enough, me too in China. Um, Peng Shui, and here's an image of Peng Shui playing tennis. And the the hashtag where is Peng Shui started to go viral on Twitter in particular. Um, and there were these other famous international tennis stars like Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka, among many others, who were also tweeting, where is Peng Shui, expressing their concern about her disappearance. Um, and at the same time, the Women's Tennis Association, and I'll show here, the Women's Tennis Association also used the hashtag, where is Peng Shui? And they made a very unusually principled uh, statement saying that they wanted the Chinese government to investigate Peng Shui's allegations of sexual assault. Um, and uh, and then there, there began this very elaborate propaganda cam campaign that was only seen outside China. So all of this time, it's now been three months later since Peng Shui's original post on Weibo. Um, but here's an example. This was actually the very first tweet coming from Chinese state affiliated media. I don't know if you can see the very top of that. Uh, but this was the first of the propaganda campaign where this person, a man, by the way, working for the Chinese government media uh, posted these pictures of Peng Shui apparently, allegedly in her apartment. Um, and, and as you can see through the, his post, it says Peng, Peng Shui's WeChat moments. WeChat is another um, extremely popular, widely used form of uh, group messaging app on, on everybody's phones practically in China. Peng Shui's WeChat Moments just posted three latest photos and said, happy weekend. Um, so this was the beginning of an incredibly elaborate propaganda campaign coming from Beijing. And, and then several weeks later, Peng Shui herself um, was presented in very heavily choreographed appearances, um, signing tennis balls for children, in China, um, having dinner with her tennis coach and a, and a number of other unnamed Chinese officials. And all the while, the Women's Tennis Association just stuck to their original demand, which was um, that they wanted an independent investigation into Peng Shui's sexual assault allegations. This was the very latest, just a few days ago, actually, this is what the Women's Tennis Association just said. Um, because Peng Shui appeared at the Winter Olympics. She gave, uh, again, a very highly controlled interview to a French news agency, which later the, even the French journalist said was very heavily chores, uh, choreographed. And so the WTA has now um, withdrawn all future tennis tournaments in China um, because they are not uh, convinced of her safety. So, and by the way, this picture here is of Zhang Gaoli, who is one of China's most powerful men. He's the former vice premier, second only to the premier, and then the president, who is Xi Jinping. Um, so all of this time, there's been a complete media blackout in China about this case, about Peng Shui. And... Um, she did actually appear at one sports event just as a spectator, and she announced her retirement from tennis. Um, so this has been in the news. Um, so what I want to do is put this in a little bit of, it's not even distant history, but this whole episode of um, 
it's by far the most explosive case in China's Me Too movement, which has been gaining a lot of momentum ever since Me Too went viral initially globally um, at the beginning of 2017, or, or sorry, the end, uh, the end of 2017. Um, but I want to take you back to 2015 in China, which I think was a real turning point and the beginning of an incredibly potent, uh, complicated, and still long-lasting feminist movement that is continuing to this day. So in 2015, on the eve of International Women's Day in March, um, these five women who are feminist activists were jailed. Um, and they were jailed for planning to celebrate International Women's Day by handing out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. Um, I write about them in my most recent book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China. And what reminds me of this case is that it's kind of similar because the Chinese government at the time decided probably, well, we'll never know what they really think, but they probably thought at the time that, well, the feminist movement might be inconvenient for us. So let's just send a warning to other uh, young people who might be tempted to join this very nascent movement. Let's just jail these five women as a warning. But actually in jailing those five women, that step backfired enormously because it, it shone a very bright spotlight on these women who had been until then completely anonymous. Nobody knew who they were. So if they hadn't been jailed, probably that there wouldn't have been a lot of attention. Um, but that attracted a lot of news media, international news attention. And then as a result of the news attention, um, these women were released 37 days later from jail. And let me just go to an example of the outrage that the jailing of these feminists provoked at the time Hillary Clinton um, in 2015, at the time she was the front runner to be the US president, she even posted C, that's President Xi Jinping of China, hosting a meeting on women's rights at the UN while persecuting feminists, shameless. So prior to 2015, these feminists, here are a couple of examples of the activities that they were involved in. They did things like this Bloody Brides um, walk, wearing these white wedding gowns that are stained with uh, faux uh, blood um, to raise awareness about the epidemic of domestic violence in China and to call for a law, an anti-domestic violence law, which by the way, the Chinese government actually passed. So um, this, this is one of the areas where the budding feminist movement is actually been successful at influencing Chinese government policy. Another one of the activities that they, uh, that the feminists organized in 2012 was called Occupy Men's Toilets. And this was something that they did in um, Southern China. These feminists took over a men's public toilet and they were calling for more women's toilets in, in public. And the local governments in Guangdong province in Southern China also responded by, uh, by saying that from now on, there are going to be more women's toilets relative to men's. Now notice that that's a pretty innocuous topic. I mean, that really is not political. It's just asking for more women's toilets. So that's very typical of the kinds of actions that these feminists uh, took part in up until the jailing of five feminists in 2015. They, and they were very deliberate about choosing topics that they thought would be completely palatable and, and rather they thought would be rather harmless and wouldn't get them into trouble. But that all changed in 2015 with the jailing of the five feminists. So when those women, the five feminists were jailed in 2015, their supporters uh, ran this social media campaign where each day uh, that the five feminists were in detention, they would post a new photograph of five women. And you can see that they're, the faces of these women have masks with the pictures of the five activists who were in jail. And um, marking the first day of detention, 
This one is the 31st day of detention. And they're all very humorous, actually. Um, and I'm only giving you a tiny little uh, snippet. But, but that's another hallmark of this feminist um, performance art, as they call it. They use a lot of wit, humor, and imagination. And so this social media campaign was just to just kind of show five women, the, the women wearing the masks of the feminist five, as they became known, um, enjoying a fun life out in uh, outside, having fun, being free, enjoying freedom of movement, while the five real women, the five feminist activists, were actually in jail, um, very heavily persecuted, denied their medication in some cases, um, and completely unaware of what was going on in the outside world. Um, but it's a little bit similar to what's happening today with Peng Shui because the very heavy handed measures of the Chinese government in, in making this very famous tennis star just disappear and then producing her um, and uh, it, it's resulted in a lot of very negative press coverage for the Chinese government. And it's actually really galvanized a lot of the Chinese feminists who are still active to this day. Um, so meanwhile, since 2015, these five feminists, the feminist five were released from jail. Um, there was no uh, significant political movement around feminism prior to 2015, but now there really is. So the feminist community in China and the feminist diaspora outside China, um, they have grown significantly since 2015. And, um, and this, this movement, I'll come back to it in a little while, um, is quite resilient. So what does this have to do with um, the current leader, the Xi Jinping, who is the president? Well, and why is feminism seen as a threat at all? I mean, why does the Chinese government need to jail feminists in the first place? I mean, why do they need to control an, a beloved tennis star um, and make her retire um, and, and have her give these very staged uh, interviews and appearances before the international media. Well, this gets to basically what I call China's patriarchal authoritarianism. And I write a lot about it in my book, but I'll give you a, just a few little highlights of it. Um, so basically Xi Jinping, who is the president now, and he is um, by all accounts, really the most uh, powerful leader that China has had since certainly since Deng Xiaoping um, and prior to that Mao Zedong himself. Mao was the founder of communist China um, and the first chairman and he ruled until his death in 1976. So here's some of the um, state media language surrounding Xi Jinping. Um, there's this notion of um, the Jia uh, Guo which is uh, the, uh, which is basically like this uh, strong man authoritarian who is Xi Jinping ruling over male dominated families. And here's a, an excerpt from a long article published by Xinhua News, which is the official Chinese uh, news media. They talk about family values and the importance um, in the Xi Jinping era. Quote, C stresses the importance of family values. He says little family, which in Chinese is xiao jia. And this, by the way, is the jia guo tian xia, which is the, this um, family under heaven. Um, he says little family, but he has in mind the big family. Big family in Chinese, the compound word for that, um, or nation is nation state, guo jia, which means the nation state. And so this long article in Xinhua was about how it's important for the security and stability of the nation state of China for each family, each little family in China to be harmonious and hierarchical where everybody plays their correct role. Um, and so according to that hierarchy, 
Well, it's very reminiscent of um, hundreds of years old Confucian models of the harmonious family. Um, and here is an excerpt from a Qing dynasty text called Biographies of Exemplary Women. And these are uh, the principles of womanly virtue. And here's a, a quote from that text hundreds of years ago in China. The daughter obeys her parents. The daughter-in-law reverently serves her parents-in-law. The wife assists her husband. The mother guides her sons and daughters. When every family is harmonious, the state is well governed. And the thing is that this centuries old Confucian text, actually you see many elements of that in um, Chinese state media today, in the People's Daily, in Xinhua News. So whereas during the um, communist revolution and the cultural revolution, the communist party at the time was smashing all of these old Confucian notions of filial piety, um, respecting your elders, um, smashing temples and burning Confucian books. They're under Xi Jinping, they are using these old traditions and reviving them to further consolidate communist party rule. And, and by the way, these pictures are Xi Jinping, that's his daughter there, he's being the good father. And here he is with his mother, He's being the good son to his mother. So even Xi Jinping himself plays a very important role within his family. But of course, he is also the father to the Chinese nation state, which is this conglomeration of many harmonious little families. So, um, so there's this um, hyper-masculine personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping. And we haven't seen this kind of personality cult really actually since the days of Mao Zedong. Um, and some of the examples are, um, there are these pop culture songs like, if you want to marry, marry someone like Xi Dada, which is what they used to call Xi Jinping in 2016 and 2017. And they, then they thought that was too endearing. So they don't use that term anymore. Um, but also very revealing was Xi Jinping's first major speech after he became um, general secretary of the Communist Party um, in January of 2013. And this was a speech about the dangers um, following the model of the collapse of, this, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. And this is a quote from Xi Jinping's speech. Then the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. And then he goes on to describe himself as being that man, the strong man who is not going to allow, unlike Gorbachev of the Soviet Union, who allowed too, too many holes to develop um, that precipitated the collapse of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and the collapse of communism across Eastern Europe, that Xi Jinping is not going to allow that to happen in China. And so, um, so it's these kinds of, and there are many examples of this, it's a very hyper-masculine personality cult presenting Xi Jinping as the manly, strong man who um, is going to be brutally effective at ensuring uh, the longevity of the Communist Party. And by the way, in all of these public statements of Xi Jinping, um, he often, he will speak actually at every year on International Women's Day, which is coming up pretty soon. Um, in recent years under Xi Jinping, there has not been any mention of working women's importance to China's economic development. The emphasis has become very much talking about how good it is to be a virtuous wife and a mother in the home, taking care of children and the elderly. And this is really consistent with a years long push by the Communist Party state to get women to uh, return to the home and play the role of obedient wife and mother. So here's another example of some of this propaganda. This one coincided with um, the ending of China's decades long one child policy, which limited urban couples to one child um, 
And it's a little bit of a misnomer because in the countryside, you know, there was a little more latitude, um, but it's became known as the one child policy. And there were, I mean, widely reported egregious women's rights abuses at that time. Um, part of the enforcement of the one child policy was um, forcing um, sterilizations among women across China. And also uh, in the early 1980s in particular, there were many, many forced abortions. And then that use of force with the general population, um, it, it wasn't, the, the, the use of brute force declined somewhat. And then there was a seismic shift in policy. At the end of 2015, which is when this particular article with the, and this uh, image that you're seeing is the, the cover picture that accompanied this article and the headline, this was on the People's Daily in December, 2015, female university students with babies, brighter job prospects, student moms on the rise. So there was a 180 degree shift in tone, in propaganda and in policy that went from uh, forcing women to only have one child, to have fewer babies um, with the use of a lot of violence across the country to actually trying to get women to have more babies and not just more babies, but have them while they're very young. And this particular article was encouraging uh, young women who are college students to have babies. Um, and this image that they use is quite, um, well, quite an allegory because the, the mother figure there holding the baby, you don't even see the face, but you can see that the mother figure is um, a university graduate because they're wearing this mortarboard on their, on their head. So that's emblematic of the fact that the Chinese government, when they say in this new pro-natalist policy that they say they want women to have more babies, they're specifically talking about college educated women. Um, it's, it's part of their long tradition of population engineering. So, um, so the propaganda surrounding this pronatalism, and it's also pushing women into getting married, um, which maybe you wanna ask me about, I'm actually not talking about that in this presentation, but my first book was called Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. And that was that focused a lot on in 27, uh, 2007, the Chinese government started pushing this term leftover woman to refer to a, a woman in her mid twenties who was single to shame and insult those kinds of women, women in their twenties who are still single to, to shame them and stigmatize them and push them into getting married. So um, th that, that there's a continuum of propaganda. So the, the pro-marriage propaganda began in 2007 and now it's morphed into a very aggressively pro-marriage plus pro-natalist propaganda push um, that is targeting in, in particular Han Chinese college educated women. As these pictures show you. Um, and so by the way, the the end of the one child policy came at the end of 2015. Um, and that was the beginning of the two child policy. But just last year in June, uh, because birth rates have continued to fall, the Chinese government thought the two child policy isn't enough. We, ne we now need a three child policy. So that is now the policy. And the propaganda is to try to get women to have three babies. Um, so here's just an example. Um, this is from People's Daily Online from 2017, when the government was really pushing back then, it was the two child policy. There are all these pictures of very you know, conventionally attractive young women who are graduates, new graduates from college, or perhaps getting their master's degree. Um, there, there were articles about how happy the women were when they had a baby while they were still getting their degree. Um, and here's a quote from one of the articles. Female university students, joyful love. Freshman year, live together. Sophomore year, get pregnant. Junior year, 
have baby. Um, and this, this uh, one is an actual headline from the People's Daily. Under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. So that's very typical of the propaganda that you still see today. Um, it's trying to push particularly Han Chinese college educated or college students who are women into actually having babies and hey, have your baby when you're in college. That's uh, is the message from the Chinese government. And here are some of the pictures. So this woman, um, she's graduating, getting her bachelor's or master's degree. Not only does she already have a little toddler, but she there, her hand is cradling her visibly pregnant belly. She, so she has a second baby on the way. And then here, you know, these new graduates are all very happily cooing over this little baby in the car in, in the carriage there. So that's the kind of propaganda that you see today. And except that today, as of last June, the new policy is the three child policy. Um, and along with the pronatalism, um, there's a lot of insulting language uh, that accompanies these kinds of messages. And, and I feel like this is a, a quote that gives you an indication of the kinds of messages you still see coming from Chinese state media. Um, this is actually from way back in 2011. Um, it says, pretty girls don't need a lot of education to marry into a rich and powerful family, but girls with an average or ugly appearance will find it difficult. These kinds of girls hope to further their education in order to increase their competitiveness. The tragedy is they don't realize that as women age, they're worth less and less. So by the time they get their MA or PhD, they're already old, like yellowed pearls. So that's, that's sending the clear message to, to women who have graduated from college that, hey, you know what? You may not want to go on and pursue that MA or PhD because you know, by the time you graduate, probably no, nobody's going to want to marry you. So you should rethink your ambitions for your furthering your education. Um, and, oh, okay. I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly. Um, here is a, a graph to show you when you think about why the Chinese government is threatened by feminism. Here's one reason. Look at this graph of births from 2000 to, to uh, 20, 2021. This is from Statista. This is the last screen grab I did. And as you can see that at the end of 2015, the Chinese government ended the one child policy. There was a little bump in births that year, but even then um, it wasn't that many. But then past that initial bump in births, the birth rate fell again and has continued to just plummet. And actually the birth rate last year that was announced was the lowest that China has seen in many decades, um, going back to 1960. So the Chinese government see, is faced with what it perceives to be a demographic crisis, absolutely plummeting birth rates and uh, the aging of the population and the shrinking of the workforce. So they, they really want college educated Han Chinese women to have more babies. But quickly, I wanna to touch on, um, it's not just bringing up the raw number of births, it's engineering a particular kind of, it, of population that is perceived to be quote unquote high quality. So at the same time in Xinjiang, there is, uh, the complete opposite message directed at the minority Uyghur population um, because they see, the Chinese government sees higher birth rates in Xinjiang among Uyghur women to be, uh, well, this is a quote from 2017, worryingly high birth rates and rapid population growth. Um, and so in 2017, they restricted the number of babies that Uyghur and Kazakh Muslim women could have. Um, and they restricted them to two children. And prior to that time, uh, 
those minority women were allowed to have more children than Han Chinese women. And this is linked to, if you want to ask uh, in the Q&A, this notion of population quality, which is just as important as the, the raw number of births. Let me just end, come back to the Me Too movement and feminism and why it is seen to be a threat. Um, it's because it's so popular. I mean, ever since 2015, there have just been so many young women who are really drawn um, to these messages of feminism. And um, here, this is a picture of feminists who are actually um, celebrating the longevity of the feminist movement after the government banned the most influential feminist social media site called Feminist Voices. This was in 2018. And also, according to this study by Hong Kong University, in 2018, Me Too was one of the top 10 most censored topics on China's WeChat. Um, and also another important point is that as of several years ago, the government has labeled feminism as a very subversive, particularly Western feminism. Um, it's quote unquote, Western hostile forces using Western feminism to interfere in China's handling of women's affairs. Let me see. So I'm going to end the, let me put push, oh dear. How do I stop share? Um, uh, oh, here, sorry. I think I found it. Okay. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Dan, or? Yeah, you know, we uh, appreciate uh, that, that presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions that have come through on Zoom. Can I just get a show of hands of those of you in the room, who, people who might want to ask a question as well? All right, um, great. Um, maybe we'll start with just one or two in the room and then uh, turn it over uh, to you, Professor Benfill, Stan, if you wouldn't mind facilitating the, the questions. Uh, one thing that, that just strikes me, this is not so much a question, but just an observation, um, is the comparisons between China and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a country uh, that I follow pretty closely, and, and uh, as, I, as I heard your presentation, um, it, it struck me that there's something uh, parallel going on in some ways in, in other countries like Saudi Arabia where the rulers uh, are very nervous about letting a, a social movement evolve right, that might uh, spiral out of their control. So while simultaneously you have moves that appear to be favorable to increased women's rights, like um, w women being able to drive in Saudi Arabia, uh, in parallel to that, we have the act of jailing of, of feminist leaders, right? Uh, and so there's a mixed message saying, yes, you can have rights, right? Uh, women, we want to increase women's rights, but we want to control the narrative, we want to do it, we don't want to um, demonstrate any weakness uh, in the face of, of a social movement. Uh, we, ha we have one question we'll start off with here. Please come on up and introduce yourself and uh, what you're studying. Hi, I'm Emma Hinckley. I'm studying geology. Um, and I was just wondering what sort of ways are you able to research this? Because it seems like a lot of the information has been like blacked out or just very difficult to access. And I'm wondering about how that works in your field of study. Um, well, thanks for that question. That's very important. So basically my research was all undertaken when I was in China. I'm not in China right now. Um, I'm in New York, but I've written two books. My first book was actually based on my PhD, which um, I did at Tsinghua University in Beijing. I was their first American uh, sociology uh, PhD student. And um, so I did extensive interviews for my dissertation, which looked at, actually looked at um, gender and the real estate market um, in China. And then uh, I interviewed hundreds of women and men um, in person and also using Weibo itself. There, it was actually much freer back then when I was, I got my PhD in 2014. 
So I did extensive on the ground, um, face-to-face interviews with people when I was living there. And then um, that was for my first book. And then my second book, Betraying Big Brother, um, focused really on the feminist activists. And I was also doing face-to-face interviews with all of these feminist activists. I traveled to a lot of different cities to interview the feminists. Um, I interviewed all of the the women who are known as the Feminist Five who were jailed in 2015, and also a a lot of other feminist activists. Um, So I I did all of that on the ground, but um, my book came out in 2018. And in fact, I went back to Beijing in 2019 to give a book talk but that was the last time I was in Beijing uh, and things have become much, much more repressive just in the last couple of years. Um, Beijing has expelled a large number of particularly American foreign correspondents. And so um, all of the information that I have in my books and um, that's from personal on the ground interviews um, and then historical reading, but then, but but um, but you can see what the Chinese state media is doing. I mean, that's that's public, and you can just go online and see what the propaganda is. Um, but it is much much more difficult now to do this kind of ethnographic research on the ground, face to face. It's much more difficult, and. Um, and I would say, you know, there are a lot more risks as well for the people that you're interviewing, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna jump on here uh, for Zoom. We have a lot of Zoom questions that have come in, so I will try to um, see how many we can get to here. Um, let me ask one question from one of our students, a student named Carly Peterson, said she'd like me to ask it for her. She's a psychology major, major global women's studies minor, really interested in um, the patriarchal authoritarianism you talked about in Chinese culture, and is just curious about how this compares to the history of Western cultures, which also for a long time had that course in many places now may still have some of that lingering, of course. Um, But then feminist movements did prove to be successful and to make inroads. Is that political environment of China, she asks, the biggest hindrance to the progression of the feminist movement? Or are there other factors at play, cultural factors, other things that complicate it? Yeah, that's a really good question, because a lot of people who, um, who look at the state of gender inequality in China today, a lot of them attribute it to Chinese culture, something that is rather amorphous. Um, Culture is a living thing. I mean, it's constantly changing. And there are these traditions. There's the Confucian tradition, of course, where women are play a subservient role. But in all of my observations and and research that I've done over the years, it's actually almost 12 years now that I've been researching um, the state of gender in in contemporary China. My conclusion is actually, if it weren't for all of these authoritarian policies coming from the Communist Party state, that the culture in China is incredibly progressive and open and uh, really cutting edge. The young people in China are extraordinarily imaginative and they want to liberate themselves. I mean, they have embraced all sorts of um, new fads and, um, and, and are actually naturally becoming very feminist. So it's not, the one thing that I would say is a strong remnant of Confucian culture, which of course is hundreds of years old and is uh, 
certainly predates by far um, communist rule and authoritarian rule is this notion of filial piety, where children are expected to obey and respect their parents in particular. So that uh, that has been that notion of filial piety, which is a traditional Chinese cultural virtue, that has really been weaponized by the Chinese government so that whenever they arrest a young activist, uh, say a feminist activist, or this is true of any activist who is young, they will always use, they will always exploit that person's love for their parents and say things when they're being interrogated, like, oh, you know, you're such a, with the, with the feminists, for example, when they were being, uh, when they were jailed and they were subjected to repeated hours and hours of interrogation every day, a long line of questioning was, you know, you, how can you live with yourself? You're such an ungrateful daughter. You're such a bad daughter. Your parents are so worried about you. You've caused so much trouble for them. You know, don't you care about them? Don't you want them to have a better life? Um, that's one line of questioning. But another even more disturbing approach used by um, government security agents when they're questioning feminist activists or other young activists is they'll actually do something to the parents or, or other elder relatives, extended family, they may actually detain the family members and force them to do something or get the parents to go and talk to their children who are in detention and say, you tell your child to behave. Um, so so culture, um, culture is always changing. Um, and, and it's because, and, and the subtitle of my new book, Betraying Big Brother, is The Feminist Awakening in China. And it's you can see this all across China. There is a real awakening. There is a seismic shift on the ground in consciousness, particularly among young people who are in college or are college graduates. And even, even in their later high school years, that they're just much more aware of systemic um, sexism and misogyny or they have themselves been the victims of sexual violence, um, uh, or they're, they're victims of domestic violence. And there is a huge shift um, in mainstream society, particularly among the young. And so that, it, that culture is changing radically. Um, but it, the Communist Party state now is using these very oppressive measures. It's using propaganda and it's changing policies to try to stop that change, to try to prevent feminist beliefs from catching on. Um, and so there is a real struggle or a real tension, um, conflict between the top-down government efforts to wipe out a feminist movement and to try to get young women to believe in traditional virtues of being a good mother and wife in the home um, and and the, from, from the ground up, you can see in the birth statistics and falling marriage statistics that young women in particular are increasingly resistant to pressure to marry and have children. Thank you. That's that's really, uh, really interesting. Um, going along with the um, question about the activists, one student, Michelle Coleman, uh, wrote, I have read your book and I have wondered what the feminist five are up to now. Well, um, I guess this isn't a media interview, so I don't like talking too much about the individuals because they are still very closely surveilled by the Chinese government. So I'll just generally say that, um, that actually four of the five are still active, only one of them has left, really left feminist activism. Um, so, I, and because there's such a harsh crackdown right now on feminist activists in China, um, I, I don't really want to draw attention to 
those women now because they don't, you know, they don't want too much attention on themselves right now. But the thing is that the thing that one uh, characteristic of this feminist movement is that it is not about individual heroes. It's a collective movement. Um, it's a, a large community of feminists. And today, a lot of their actions, their political actions are kind of anonymous. So you don't know exactly who started it, whose idea it was, um, but you still, you see them and they're still active. And they, they're very active, they were very active in the beginnings of the Me Too movement in China in pushing the Me Too hashtag or versions of the Me Too hashtag that could try to get around censors on um, social media. Um, but it's a distinguishing characteristic of the feminist movement that it's not about any one famous individual. And that is partly uh, the key to its continued resilience and its continued momentum. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions about Hong Kong and one about Hong Kong and Taiwan. Are there differences between in terms of policies regarding women and feminism. Of course, Taiwan's a different country, but what about Hong Kong? Could you talk briefly about that? Yes, yeah, so very sadly, over the last couple of years, we've seen an incredibly brutal crackdown um, on freedoms in Hong Kong by the Chinese government, um, which has unveiled this new national security law. And so Hong Kong several years ago you know, was still an incredibly vibrant place. It was a former British colony. Um, the Chinese government was supposed to leave it untouched and not uh, interfere with it for for 50 years after its handover from Great Britain in 1997. So um, Hong Kong, up until very recently, was uh, a f kind of free place where activists could seek refuge. They they could escape. The, the net of Chinese government security agents, if they crossed over to Hong Kong, then they would be safe. But that unfortunately is no longer true. You are no longer safe if you make it to Hong Kong and there has been just a really rapid decline in press freedom, academic freedom, and there is a very little freedom of assembly in Hong Kong today as well. Unfortunately, and of course, Taiwan is completely different, um, de facto independent, although it hasn't declared it's independent. And, um, and, but Taiwanese feminists have a strong influence over mainland Chinese uh, feminists. Um, but Hong Kong itself, the feminism in Hong Kong, I mean, Hong Kong is a much smaller city than all of the People's Republic of China. And so, um, the uh, Chinese feminists who are living in southern China often went to Hong Kong, and um, but the feminist movement as a whole is much more of a kind of People's Republic of China phenomenon as opposed to a Hong Kong phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we may only have time for one more question. Let me give you this question from Caleb. Um, says, in recent years, China has taken a lot of measures to try and increase the economic burden of having children to increase birth rate. This has included things like education reform, with one example being the recent double reduction policy. Do you think any of these policy changes will be sufficient to change the culture? And also, do you think the government's emphasis on childbearing has any hope of actually increasing women's rights? Well, um... The way that the new policy, the three, which is now a three-child policy, has been framed in Chinese state media is as wonderful news um, and uh, more rights for women. Women are now allowed to have three children, whereas in the past they, they weren't allowed to. Um, and there, I mean, there are other ways in which the Chinese government has actually um, introduced some changes that are beneficial for women's rights. For example, in 2016, 
China passed a landmark anti-domestic violence law, which was a legal milestone for victims of domestic violence. Unfortunately, the thing about laws in China is that what may be very good on the books, what may look very good, is not enforced at all. And that's the problem, is that you don't really have a functioning legal system and you don't have genuine rule of law. Um, but um, I fear that we're actually going to see a lot more curtailment of women's rights and reproductive rights in the future, um, that it's only a matter of time before, well, for example, uh, there has been some reporting on men finding it, it extremely difficult to get a vasectomy now in China. Um, and that's so, so far, we, there hasn't been any nationwide ban on abortion. Um, and I don't think that there will be because actually there were so many forced abortions um, several decades ago that I, that I, I don't think that we would see a nationwide ban on abortion. But sadly, um, it, just in spite of this very vibrant feminist movement, I think that the overall trend coming from above, from the Chinese government itself, is of more restrictions on women's rights. Even though every now and then you're going to see some tinkering on the edges, um, but any kind of, I, I think that any kind of policy coming from the government uh, that helps women overall and protects their rights is a result of very a very hard won battle on the ground coming from feminist activists and just mainstream of opinion, and that's why it is still very important that this uh, this feminist movement and these feminist voices continue to speak out because they actually still have an effect on Chinese government policy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm glad we have that little little bit of hope there at the end of otherwise a kind of depressing message. So Quinn, we'll uh, we'll turn turn things back over to you. Sure, uh, Dr. Hung Fincher, thank you so much for your presentation and for for the rich discussion. Um, for all those on Zoom, if we can just uh, give her a, a round of applause, a Zoom clap, that would be great. We really appreciate everything that uh, you've contributed to us today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you.